So we go from the beauty to the beast. <laughs> the beautiful song to the uh, talk about surviving. Not inconsistent, the one helps you to do the other. Well, the first hour we talked about uh, the basics of spirit, the reality of spiritual survival. If you don't acknowledge that there's a that there's a challenge, you're not apt to rise to the challenge. If you don't acknowledge that we are at war, you're not apt to fight the war. So uh, there's no question we are at war. St. Paul told us that. All the saints have told us that. There, there, this is a reality. Some of the physical realities that, you know, we learn a lot from the natural order because there's one creator, God. God created nature. The realities we deal with in nature point towards higher realities. We can learn about spiritual realities. That's why Jesus gave us parables. He used analogies with uh, agriculture, right, because people understood it. Uh, St. Paul used analogies with uh, athletics and the military. So I'm not uh, making up something here that hasn't long ago come before me. So we're going to use these analogies from the natural order and survival in a battle situation to spiritual survival. Uh, if you do not practice these things, you are easy prey. If you don't understand these survival techniques and tactics, um, then the enemy doesn't have much trouble with you. Uh, it'd be real easy to overcome you. Things that you have to know in a survival situation, basics, right? Think about it. You're, you're stranded in the desert, in the Arctic, in the jungle, in the mountains, um, <laughs> in the city. You, you have basic things you need in a survival situation. Food, right? You've got to have food. You've got to have water. You've got to have shelter if you're going to survive for any length of time. It may be shelter from the cold. It may be shelter from the heat. Shelter from the elements. Fire. You know, have to know how to build a fire. You have to know how to stay warm. Otherwise, hypothermia sets in. Now, I'm going to take all these things and, and relate them to the spiritual life because they all have application. Navigation. You know, you're lost in the mountains, in the desert, in the jungle. You have to know how to navigate. You have to know where you came from. You have to know where you're going. It's a good idea to be able to pinpoint where you are. A lot of people don't know where they came from, don't know where they're going, and have no clue where they are right now. That's called being lost. You ever notice why a lot of people are lost? They seem like they're lost. Why do they seem that way? Because they are. Right? No clue. And a, a, a related reality is the identity crisis. You've heard that term, right? People have an identity crisis. Well, an identity crisis is, well, I don't know who I am. Why don't you know who you are? Well, you don't know where you came from, you don't know where you're going, and you don't know who you are and what your mission is right now. Navigation. Essential for survival. You have to know how to navigate. In the old days, we had a, a compass and a topographical map. Now you have a GPS. But I learned something about it. I have four GPSs. I learned something about GPSs, though, after the first one. You have to know how to use it. <laughs> it really helps to know how to use it. Then you can navigate. Same thing with a compass, right? The compass points north. Well, OK. That, that, that gives you some orientation. But uh, if you don't know where you are, uh, and you don't have any relation, you know, well, where, where's, your, where's your headquarters or where's, where are the friendly forces? Um, it's hard to know which direction to go in, you know, the friendly forces may be south. 
but you don't have a clue where they are and you don't know where you are now in relation to that so navigation is important know the enemy you have to know the nature of the enemy today people in general and even people in the Catholic Church are largely clueless as to the nature of the enemy I've had priests and theologians to my face deny the existence of Satan and the fallen angels. Heresy. An obstinate post-baptismal denial of some element of faith and morals which must be accepted with divine and Catholic faith or an obstinate doubt. I doubt there's a devil. Well, you can doubt it all you want. He's going to get you with his pitchfork, then you won't doubt that. <laughs> or an obstinate doubt, doubt, doubt concerning what you need to believe. And it's not hard to know what you need to believe. You must study the catechism of the Catholic Church. I started immediately as a deacon b before I was ordained a deacon. I had the first draft of the Catechism of the Catholic Church because coincidentally, well, that's wrong, providentially, God put the director of religious education for the Archdiocese of New York in the same monastery where I was making my pre-ordination retreat. Monsignor Michael Wren was there. He gave me a copy of the first draft of the catechism in a red crayon. And he said, tell me what you think. Because the Vatican was soliciting response from religious education people around the world. So I saw the first draft and every succeeding draft of the catechism. When it came out in Spanish, I, I, began, I began to use it in Spanish to preach and to teach and then finally came out in English I used that I did my series on the Catechism of the Catholic Church the teaching of Jesus Christ it remains the only thing of its kind in the world in the Catholic Church in scope and depth it's 48 hours of lectures and question and answer that synthesizes the Catechism of the Catholic Church to this day I marvel the, you know, there's, there have been a couple of small uh, courses on that, you know, six, eight hours here and there. But uh, the, the, I, I'm, at least I'm not aware of anything like it in, in video uh, and audio. It's been on EWTN nonstop since 1997. They play episodes 1 through 50, and then they start one again the next week. And so it has been for years need to know your faith you know the enemy you adapt and improvise adapt to the situation improvise the situation is not the same last year as it is this year ten years ago as it is today there are, the essentials may be the same but but you find different things swirling around you when I was growing up, an archbishop, Archbishop Fulton Sheen, could be on national television in the United States of America. You think that could happen today? No. Wrong. He was on national television. There was no cable television. There were three networks back then. He was on one of the major networks, prime time, Sunday night, same time I'm on, Sunday night. But I'm on cable, and that's not the same. I mean, it's good. We reach millions of people, but we should have made progress. Decades ago, he was reaching more people on national television. Adapt and improvise. You know, we adapted and improvised. You know, Mother Angelica, she adapted. Can't get on national television. Oh, get on cable. She looked into it, didn't know a thing about television or satellites. Called up in the, out of the yellow pages in the phone book under satellites. <laughs> I 
I want a satellite. Who are you? You understand what a satellite is? Well, it's a thing you shoot up in the sky. I want one. Now. Adapt and improvise. Escape and evade. You've got to know how to escape the enemy. You've got to know how to evade being wounded or killed in action. I'll put this up at the top. I've got 10 things that I list as kind of a summary here, but up at the top, number one, and this is right out of the Army Survival Manual, and I'm going to use it for our survival manual. Number one, the will to survive. That's number one. You have to have the will to live. Time and time and time and time again in survival situations, it's been proven that those who had the will to survive most often did. You have to have that spirit which will not quit in the face of insurmountable odds. You're not going to quit. I did a very well-received conference in Boston a few years back. And Surrender is Not an Option was the title of it. Cardinal O'Malley and uh, the preacher to the papal household, Father Condola Mesa, sat right in the first row. Surrender is not an option. Well, surrendering your will to live, your will to survive, that's not an option. <clears throat> Going to hell isn't an option unless you're out of your mind. Denying the existence of hell is not an op option unless you're a heretic or an ostrich burying your head in the sand. Trust me, there is God, and there is the devil. There is good, there is evil, there is truth, and there are lies. There's heaven and there is hell. There is no question about it. That is a doctrinal certainty. There is heaven and there is hell, and you decide where you go for all eternity. Now, that's survival. That's eternal survival. You survive a few years on the face of the earth, that's, that's good. Physical survival. Why are we here? Well, one reason, really. We're here to get there. That's why we're here. I can still hear Sister Mildred in the third grade. You remember Sister Mildred? I've talked about Sister Mildred before. She was a force to be reckoned with. <laughs> she was a, about a four foot 11 force. Four foot 11 high and four foot 11 wide. <laughs> now that's a force. And you didn't mess with Sister Mildred. She. Sister Mildred didn't walk, she floated. <laughs> Sister would float in the room, and she had eyes everywhere. She saw everything you were doing. And I remember her stopping in front of my desk. She would quiz you. You know, remember before I said you, the only way to know if the students have learned is to test them. In its absolute silliness, to think otherwise. The only way to ascertain if they have acquired the subject matter is to test them. You don't assume. As my high school chemistry teacher, Mr. James Stiles, said the first minute we met him, he was walked into the room and he wrote the word assume on the blackboard. I am Mr. James Stiles. That's number one. Number two, Never assume you make an ASS out of you and me. Never assume. Don't assume they know it. Assume they don't until they prove they know it. You've got to test. So you have to know these things. You have to have the will to live, will to survive, it helps a great deal in a survival situation 
if you are physically fit, right? It helps a great deal in a spiritual survival situation if you are spiritually fit. What does that mean? Well, first of all, it means you've got to be in a state of grace. If you are not in a state of grace, you're basically dead. Now, you can be brought back to life. Jesus brought the, the, the dead back to life, right? He raised the dead. So, so he can do it through the power of grace. But if you are in mortal sin, the life of grace in you is dead. By definition, mortal sin extinguishes the life of grace in the soul. Now, that can be resuscitated. We know. Uh, you repent of your sins, being Catholic, you're conscious of serious sin, you go to confession. And the power of sanctifying grace brings you back to life. That's one of the sacraments of, of healing, as we call it. So, you have to be in, in shape to be able to survive. Uh, you know, in the military, we, we had great emphasis on physical training, PT, physical training. Well, for you, it's ST, spiritual training. If you're lazy, you're not going to make it. If you're disinterested, not going to happen. You have to be engaged. You have to be motivated. Motivated people survive. Unmotivated people don't. People who are prepared have a better chance of survival. Don't hope for a miracle in a survival situation. Could it happen? Yes. It's presumption to think it will happen. You must be prepared. And if you are not prepared and you have not prepared your family, you are derelict in your duty. You know, you, you, if you do your part and they don't do their part, that's not your fault. You do the best you can, but you've got to be prepared. We're going to go through the acronym. Survival. Those letters, eight letters, S-U-R-V-I-V-A-L, survival. S, size up the situation. Okay, here we are, 21st century, United States of America. Step back, look at where we are, size up the situation so you can know how to react. Well, you could do it like this, maybe, like I do. I'm more than a half a century old. And I look at what things were like when I began, when I was a boy. Well, Bishop Sheen was on television. You know, who else? Bob Hope, Milton Berle, you know, Perry Como, people like that. You know, pretty innocent television shows, right? Okay. Uh, I don't know how many television channels I have with, I have Dish Network where I live, because I got to check up on EWTN every now and then, make sure that my shows are on there. So I've got, I don't know, 150 channels. 150 channels or more, and nothing is on. <laughs> right? Well, that's part of the situation. I look at my country, which when I was a boy was certainly the most powerful country on the face of the earth. Certainly did a lot of good, and despite what some people say, by and large was a Judeo-Christian culture. That's a fact. Well, look at it today. That we could have arguments that, that you can't pray in school, Arguments that you can, the Ten Commandments can't be seen. By the way, I live in northwest Montana, and it's a little bit different there than, than some places. They, they've got big um, plaques of the Ten Commandments everywhere the eye can see.
Well, yeah, that, that's good. You, but, but the Catholic Church didn't do it, the Baptists did it. <laughs> but good for them. And, and uh, you know, that's one of those things I wish I'd have thought of that. Uh, you know, we, 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 should, we should do that. Now, you can't put it on, on public property. So all the people who own property, they put it up there and, you know, their property is right on the side of the highway or, you know, hey, I own the property, I'll put what I want over there. You know, well, next they'll say you can't put it on private property, maybe. Size up the situation. Size it up in terms of four things. The creed, what we believe. The seven sacraments. The Ten Commandments and prayer, the four sections of how the church teaches the faith. Well, where are in terms of the creed? Wow, a lot of people don't believe. You know why the world is in the sick, sorry state that it's in? Because of the Catholic Church. Because of our miserable failure to be everything we can be. Be all you can be. Wow, that. Wasn't that an army commercial? Be all you can be. Well, that's our motto. That's the church. You should be everything you can be. Jesus Christ gave his church to hold the very world in being. And to the degree we are faithful to our mission, the world is held up. To the degree we are unfaithful, and I don't mean the church as a whole. The church is faithful as a whole. The church is indefectibly holy as a whole. Why? Because of us? No, because of him. Jesus is the head of the church. The Holy Spirit is the soul or life-giving force of the church. We are members of the mystical body of Christ. But as the individual members of the mystical body of Christ fail in their mission... In a sense, the church is weakened, and we're not strong enough to hold the world up anymore. And so what happens? Well, what happens is the world begins to sink into hell under the weight of its own iniquity, and it's our fault. Why? Because we were not what we should have been. We did not live up to our responsibility. Do you understand that less than 20% of Catholics practice their faith in North America. And it's less than that in Europe. That's pretty bad. Well, I have, let's see, four out of, my, four out of five soldiers in my company are dead. One out of five is alive and can be assigned a mission. Well, dead, <laughs> dead guys can't perform missions. If you're dead, you're dead. If you're not practicing your faith, going to mass, by the way, missing mass on Sundays without a good reason is a mortal sin. That's a fact. That's a fact. Oh, gosh, don't. Don't give me facts. <laughs> You'll only confuse me. It's right there in the catechism, and it is a fact. Now, that, I, with, without a good reason. Now, there can be a good reason. You're sick. You're elderly. You can't get to Mass. You know, you have a sick child, and you have to take care of the child. There are good reasons. I mean, you, you can... There, there, it's possible. But you should try not to. Why? Well... If you are in hostile territory, one of the things you have to do is stay healthy. It is much easier to stay healthy than to get cured from being injured or sick. So you want to try to preserve your health, your strength. You can't preserve your strength and your health if you do not have nourishment. That's the Holy Eucharist. Why does the church require us to go to Mass at least once a week on the Lord's Day, on Sundays, and Holy Days of Obligation, we need it. That's why the church doesn't do to take away our freedom or to tell us what to do or push us around. We need it. 
I, think about it. If you had to walk 100 miles to get out of un enemy territory in rough terrain, swamps, mountains, jungles, deserts, and you had nothing to eat for that time, you would have less of a chance of surviving than if you had nourishment, which helped to keep you strong enough to make progress. Without the Holy Eucharist, you do not have the, 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 the nourishment you need. That's why we have to go to Mass, stay in a state of grace, receive the Holy Eucharist. So size up the situation in, in terms of creed, in terms of sacraments, the situation. Well, you may find yourself in a situation where you're in mortal sin, you're addicted to some sin, you've got some favorite sin. It might be a sexual sin. Now that is one of the enemies, and this is another element of, of this we have to look into, because you have to know your enemy. You have to know his weapons and his tactics. Sexual sin, it's huge. Can you imagine if some of the stuff that we see in the media today, and when I say media, I mean movies, television, so forth, can you imagine in 1954, let's say some of that appeared on your television screen in 1954, they'd lock them up, right? They'd lock them up and throw away the key. Oh, but we've made progress, have we? Is that progress or regress? You know, are we winning or losing? That's an indication the battle is not going well. But we've seemed to take it quite well. You know what? Can you imagine if they insulted Jews or Muslims the way they do Catholics, the world getting away with it, oh, there'd be hell to pay. But we seem to take it quite nicely. One thing after the next, they spit in your face and you take it. Well, but they spit in Jesus' face. Well, his hour had come, and if yours comes, you take it too. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about physically. I'm talking about standing up for what you know is true, what we believe. So assess the situation, size up the situation. We have a dismal state of affairs morally in this country, not just this country, in, in the world, in the, in the whole Western world. You know, you have to be careful. Learn a little bit about history, including the Old Testament. Do you know what happened to God's people when they were unfaithful to him? He handed them over to their enemies. Right? Israel failed to be faithful to the covenant. What happened? He had, God handed them over to the enemy. Watch out that the Christian world doesn't get handed over to the enemy because of its infidelity. One person at a time. Size up the situation. Commandments, are, are, are we in general? Well, in general, yes, but me in, in particular, and you in particular. What's my situation with respect to living the moral life? Size it up. Prayer. Size up the situation. What is my life of prayer? Do you have a prayer life? There's 24 hours in a day, seven days in a week. How many hours a day do you watch television? Do you give God at least equal time? How, much, how many minutes do you spend in prayer? Size up the situation. Am I weak or strong in my belief, in my moral life? in my prayer life, in my sacramental life. Size up the situation. That's the first letter in the word survival, S. Size up the situation. You've got to do that for your spiritual survival. Then you, undo haste makes waste. Well, in the natural order, in a survival situation, what they're talking about is you, 
you're, you, you realize that there you are behind enemy lines. You're caught in a bad situation. You're being hunted by the enemy. Undo haste makes ways. That means don't go running headlong. Oh, I got to escape. I got to escape. So you just try to get out of there. No. Collect your thoughts. Remember your training. Be still and know that I am God. All the noise in a noisy world is part of the enemy's tactic. All the noise, the constant noise, the television, the radio, noise, 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 activity, activity, activity. Families don't even have time to sit down together and have a meal at the end of the day. That is a bad mistake. But, but Junior has soccer practice. You know, Susie has a dance class or whatever. Well, that, those are good things. I'm not against that. I'm, I'm for that. But the family has to have a certain priority. You must spend time together. Don't be so much in a hurry that you forget basic things. No, don't let your mind be, be so speeded up that it's hard to just sit down and talk to God. You have to spend time every day alone with God. Yeah, oh, you pray with your wife, your husband, your, your children, great, perfect. Pray with your parents, excellent. Spend some time alone with God. If you have to do it early in the morning, do it. That's when I have to do it. Because if I don't do it then, there's a chance I might not do it if I get too busy. And if you're too busy to pray, you're too busy. That's all. You have to be still. Don't be preoccupied with a million things. Remember Martha and Mary? Right? Uh, Martha was uh, concerned about all the uh, elements of hospitality, she, the, the cooking, the cleaning, and, uh, and, and, and Mary just sat at the feet of the Lord, soaking up his every word. And, and Martha complained, oh, tell Mary to help me. Martha, Martha, people, people, you are anxious and concerned about many things, one thing alone matters. Mary has chosen the better part and it will not be denied her. Undue haste makes waste. Slow down. Slow down in a busy, noisy world. Slow down. Be quiet. Because the voice of God usually comes as a tiny whisper. As it came to Elijah on the mountain. He was in hostile territory. Remember what happened to Elijah, the prophet? They were hunting him, right? King Ahab and, and, and his pagan wife, Jezebel, they hated Elijah. He was a disturber of the peace. Yeah, he disturbed people's minds because he told them the truth. The king didn't like that, and, and the king's wife liked it even less. I like Elijah. My favorite character from the Old Testament. Remember Elijah? They, 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 they hunted him down. He had to hide, escape an evasion, hiding in caves in the mountains. The army was hunting him. And then God came and spoke to him in a still, tiny whisper. And he listened to God. But you can't hear God if there's all that noise going on. So slow down, get some silence in your life, even if it's only 15 minutes. That's better than nothing. I also like Elijah. You remember what Elijah did to the false prophets? 450 of them. He took them down. It's it. I'm right. The Bible says it. He took them down to the book, Brook Kidron, 450 of them, and he slit their throats. Now, don't go getting any ideas. <laughs> this is metaphorical, analogical. 
Undue haste makes waste. R, remember where you are in this acronym on survival. R, remember where you are. The third letter in the word S-U-R, survival. S-U-R, R, remember. Remember where you are. You are on a battlefield. The enemy is not human. The enemy is spiritual. Our, our, our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against fallen angels. You have real enemies, and this is a real war, and there are real consequences of this real war. And the consequences are eternal. Eternal life or eternal death, heaven or hell. I keep coming back to that. Some of my friends that, that, that know about education and how the human mind works say that you have to repeat something 18 times for the human mind to, to grasp it once and for all. Well, I, I probably won't repeat anything here 18 times, but it might seem like it. <laughs> Remember where you are. Battlefield. 21st century battlefield. 21st century warfare, spiritual warfare. You're caught behind enemy lines. You're in a morally toxic environment. Parents, don't be irresponsible with your children. Do not hand them over to the world to devour. Equip them. Equip them. Teach them. Well, they, they don't want to they don't want to learn. They don't want to know the rosary. Wow. I understand that. But you you know, your dad, your mom, right? You can you put your battle hat on, it says mom. You know what that spells? M O M? Boss. <laughs> you know that one that D A D? Boss. Don't be a wimp. I remember my mother, you know, <laughs> this was the old days, and uh, my mother didn't believe in Dr. Spock or a, a lot of the, 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 uh, the, the, the contemporary, the, well, they weren't contemporary yet, but they started to be when I was around, I guess, in high school. <clears throat> my mother stopped hitting me with her hand when I was 12. 13, 14. Now, she didn't do that anymore because it hurt, she hurt her hand. I got to be too big, you know, so my mother wasn't, you know, silly. She, she was five foot four, you know. But she had a black belt in all household implements. Uh, you know, now I'm not a, don't somebody accuse me of, you know, fostering uh, child abuse or something. I'm not, you know, I, you know, you don't want, I don't want you to abuse anybody, but use your head. You know, there are times when, and you don't necessarily have to use physical means, but you, you can impose discipline. You know, oh, you did this? Wonderful. I hope you like it the way your room looks, because it's about the only thing you're going to be seeing for a long time, you know? Or I hope you like manual labor, because <clears throat> you're going to get real familiar with it. I mean, I can't believe, some, I, I know, I had to do everything. By the time I was 12, my mother worked. My mother was a registered nurse, had to go to work early in the morning, come home, take care of the house, cook, clean, do everything. We, we started helping real early. We had to, you know, and, and, it, and it's only right. It's only right. Listen, people had to, my grandparents had to leave school when they were 12, 13. Why? They had to work. Now, we've had it pretty good. Now, listen to what I'm saying because I'm rarely wrong on these things. I wish I were wrong more often. We've become very fat and lazy, morally speaking, spiritually speaking, socially speaking, culturally speaking. Spoiled, rotten. That's about to be over. Most of us have had our net worth, well, reduced significantly in the last couple years. 
I don't have any stocks or bonds or anything, but I have to support myself. I don't get support from the church. I'm not tax exempt, by the way. I don't, uh, I don't uh, claim tax exempt status. I don't accept gifts, donations, charitable contributions. Why not? Because <laughs> if you start taking stuff from the government, the government's going to start requiring things like what you can say and what you can't say. I got warned before the last presidential election, you could, we could take away your tax-exempt status. Yeah, you could if I had one. <laughs> Why don't you check with the IRS? <laughs> You'll find out I'm a good citizen, paying taxes, lots of them. So, you know, back again to, uh, you know, assess your, your circumstances, size up the situation. I don't trust the government as far as I could throw them. Size up the situation. Undo haste makes waste. Remember where you are. B, vanquish fear and panic. Okay, I'll tell you what. If you don't think we're in a fix, you're not thinking straight. We are in the worst situation of my lifetime. Economically, we, we, we're bankrupt. Do you, do you know that? The United States of America is bankrupt. And China holds the debt. That'll help you sleep at night. <laughs> we're bankrupt and getting worse by the day. We are technically insolvent. But if you ran your household like the United States government runs it, it's, you'd be declaring bankruptcy immediately. You'd have to. If you were spending a thousand times more than you have, what would happen to you? Well, what, what should happen to you? The consequences of stupidity aren't good. In plain English, you do dumb things, bad things happen. Well. But vanquish fear and panic. Okay, we're in a bad spot. Seems like the devil's winning. Seems like. But just remember this. See this book? It says Holy Bible on there. We know the last chapter. We win. That's all. We win. Now, yes, you look at the situation and... and if you like me, now I'm not a political commentator and I don't want to be a political commentator. That, that's not my job, I know that. Uh, however, uh, if I were to bury my head in the sand and pretend there isn't a problem, I'm a moral commentator and need to be. Heck, have they done, can they do anything right? <laughs> I mean, think about it. Think about it. The last couple of years, think about it. Can they do anything right? I don't know. I'm, I'm wondering. It's, it's almost like, are they doing it on purpose? <laughs> are they truly dumb or truly evil? You know, I, I, I don't know. I, I'm, just, I'm just asking the question. Nonetheless, vanquish fear and panic. Yeah, that, that's what the Army Survival Manual says with respect to survival in a bad situation. You're behind enemy lines. Vanquish fear and panic. Because if you panic, you're dead meat. There's still a God in heaven. He's not dead. He's not even sick. There's still a God in heaven. Fear is useless. What is needed is trust. Aha. That's what Jesus says in the gospel. Fear is useless. What is needed is trust. Therefore, trust in the Lord. You know the divine mercy chaplet, right? You know the picture of Jesus and the divine mercy? What does it say right at the bottom of the picture? Yeah, Jesus, I trust in you. Exercise trust. When you are, are, you're tempted to be fearful for your children, 
your grandchildren, your country, your parish. I understand that. I wake up in the middle of the night frequently scared to death, scared of a hundred things. Uh, I, I, I'm perspiring profusely. Oh, Lord, now what? Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus, I trust in you. Well, you're, you, you're gonna, you've got a heart condition, you're going to die. Jesus, I trust in you. Don't panic. Don't panic. You've got cancer. Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus, I trust in you. Your country, which you love and ought to, which perhaps you went off to World War II or Korea or Vietnam because you espouse the principles upon which this country is built and you see what's happening, the temptation can be, be fearful, panic. Don't. Jesus, I trust in you. So that's the fourth, the B, the fourth letter in the word. Survival, vanquish, fear, and panic. I improvise. You know, you've assessed the situation. You know what's going on. You've got to improvise. But, but they have a horrible, they don't have a good catechetical program in my parish, in the diocese. In the, stop. Improvise. Do you know who the, num the first responsibility for catechesis is? Not with the diocese or the parish. It's the parents. Improvise. You know, I, I mentioned it before. If you take my series on the Catechism of the Catholic Church and go through it, I promise you, you will know your faith. It's that simple. It, I didn't read, I just took the book. I didn't have to, like, make it up or something. And I synthesized the book. That's all. I, ta I, said, I talked about it in, in understandable terms. Learn your faith. You know, and then improvise. Oh, well, they won't teach me the faith. Look, a long time ago, a good bishop said to me, I worked for this bishop for a while. Matter of fact, he was the bishop who asked me to do the catechism series. And I did it for his diocese. But he told me something. He said, and, and this isn't always true, but he said, you've got to adapt and improvise. That's what the Marines say, adapt and improvise. Uh, he said, you've got to do that. Don't try to go through the diocesan channels. That's what the bishop told me. <laughs> well, it doesn't mean be disobedient. That's not what it means. But what he was saying was if you try to go through formal channels, there are a lot of people who won't want to be associated with what you're doing, even though it's good. They're not going to give you formal approval. Therefore, you, you don't want to disobey. But, you know, the bishop said unconventional warfare. That would be me. <laughs> Un unconventional warfare. See, everything I, almost everything I've done for almost 20 years is unconventional warfare. I do not operate in disobedience. I'm obedient. But they don't tell me, do this and do this and do this and do this. I do it. Like General Colin Powell says, you don't know what you can get away with till you try it. <laughs> Well, it doesn't mean do goofy things, and it doesn't mean be disobedient, but it means sometimes you have to improvise. You have to adapt to the situation. Use your head. Teach the faith, but you can't teach it if you don't know it. Improvise. V, value living. Yeah, big thing in, in survival. You've got to value living. You have to fight for your life. Spiritual survival. Fight for your moral and spiritual life. Don't just go with the flow. As Archbishop Fulton Sheen used to say, don't go with the flow, the tenor of the times. Dead bodies float downstream. Dead souls float downstream. It takes live bodies and live souls to resist the currents of the time. There's a tidal wave of hell sweeping all across the earth. You don't have to go with the flow. Resist the currents of the times. Value living. Have the will to live. That means have the will to stay in a state of grace. That means resist temptation. 
which wants to take you out. Value living. A, act like the natives, it says in the survival acronym. Act like the natives. Well, for our purposes, you know, what it means in the survival manual is if you're in the jungles of Brazil, le learn what, what the natives do, you know, what they eat, how they hunt, what kind of plants they eat, and, you know, how they, how they live, because they've adapted to their surroundings, and they know. Well, for our purposes in spiritual survival, the natives are the saints. They know how to live. They know how, they've, they adapted perfectly to a, an inhospitable climate, which is what the world is, morally and spiritually. The saints know. So you ought to know about the lives of the saints. Hmm? Act like the saints. It doesn't mean you have to do exactly what the saints did, but they taught us principles that are applicable any time, any place. Well, that's the native. They, they know how to live in order to survive. That's, that's what the, the essence of this means, act like the native. Well, why? Because they know how to survive in their, in their environment. Act like the saints who knew how to survive in this world filled with temptations, snares, traps. But how are you going to act like the saints if you don't know how they live? You know, so study, you know, one of the first things I did before I went to the seminary was I systematically studied on my own, I adapted and improvised, 500 lives of the saints. I read them, meditated about, uh, on them, prayed to them. And then you begin to interiorize, you learn from them. And then you know how to survive in that environment because they were the ones who survived best, spiritually and morally speaking. And then L, the, five, the last letter in that word survival, L, learn basic skills. You know, you have to learn basic survival skills if you're going to survive in a survival situation. Same thing spiritually. Learn your faith. Learn the moral teaching of the church. Learn the sacramental life of the church. Learn how to pray and then most of all do all of the above. And there you have it, the survival acronym. Do those things and you will have a much better chance of surviving. You'll make it. And when you make it, one day, and, I, and it'll be a day soon, if you live another hundred years, that's soon. In the context of eternity, where 10 billion years is less than a second, You'll hear those beautiful words, having come out into friendly territory. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You made it. Now at last, enter into the joy of your master's house. God bless you.